Charlie. Hello. Hello there. Yeah, this is, um, this is actually a real honour for me because the first ever web conference I went to was State of the Browser back, what, eight years ago? I can't even remember when it first started. So, 2011. So to speak at this now is like a full circle for me. You know, it's like a little, little heart thing going on. But anyway, first of all, who the hell am I? Because, you know, it's okay, you should ask that. I ask that myself a lot. I don't really know, it's okay. I'm still trying to figure it out. But I have been in this industry for 20 years now. I've been orbiting in and out of it, you know, I've kind of dipped in at times and come out again and got bored and come back. But I most recently re-entered about seven years ago and uh, I absolutely love it because this is a really interesting time. And as you may be able to tell from my accent, I am actually from the British Isles, you know. I, do, I was born here, but I don't live here anymore. <coughs> I got out early, and I moved to Berlin in Germany, um, which is an absolutely beautiful place. It's a place of uh, real sophistication, <laughs> place of you know really top quality gourmet food. It's a place of restraint and privacy. You know, I I adore that. It's such a change after London. <laughs> so, and it's incredibly stereotypically German which I absolutely love. It's all about the lederhosen and order there. <laughs> and there in Berlin, I work for a company called Springer Nature. Uh, I'm the lead front-end developer in their Berlin department. And some of you might not have heard about Springer Nature. You know, don't worry if you haven't. It's, there's not much reason you would have done. But it's actually one of the largest scientific publishers on the planet. It's been around since like 1869 or something like that. It's a really big deal. It's an old place. And it publishes things like Biomed Central, Scientific American, and the eponymous journal Nature, which you've probably heard about. You see it referenced in news reports all the time. The kind of place where if you get published in there, your career is made. And Spring Nature is all about helping scientists to get their work seen by other scientists. Those are all real scientists. I checked this. Google told me so. <laughs> but I'm not here to talk to you about science. I really wish I was. Um, I don't know anything about science. Um, but I'm actually here to talk to you about the single biggest invention in recent human history. So I think that's no biggie, you know, we can do that in half an hour. But that thing is the web, the stuff that Jeremy's just told us all about. And talking about Jeremy, I actually, I read his book. It was absolutely fantastic. So I decided to steal huge chunks of his content and put it into slides and use it. It was, uh, <laughs> it was a real honor to take his work in that way and reuse it. Um, but the web's incredible because it is stupid. Or at least, it's a bunch of stupid technologies. Stupid technologies that are all bunched together and made to work together. And I want to just give you an incredibly simplified history about it, just so we can see what we're on about with this. And I think you can easily say that the history of the web started, you know, like the prehistory of the web started with things like telegraphs. You know, you know what those are, the little beep, 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 beep things, you know, the communicated data all over the world? Well, these things got upgraded. You know, they got upgraded into things called telephones, you know, so instead of having arguments by dots and dashes, we could have arguments via our voices instead. And then the first primitive computers started to use these amazing new telephone things to have conversations between themselves. I'm sure you've seen the movie War Games, you know how that story ends out. And because they were talking to each other, just like Jeremy said, we've got a, the, some of the agreement was needed, so we came up with all these network protocols to make things work together. TCP, IP, UDP, all working together. And then all these local networks that, that were kind of talking to each other, suddenly started talking en mass with each other. And we had the interconnected global network, the internet, 
the foundation for everything else that would come. And then on top of that, we built application protocols because we needed more standards to make things work better, you know, email and SSH and FTP, stuff we're all familiar with today. And we needed ways of identifying where we would find stuff. You know, Jeremy talked again about the, the at symbol. And we had, so we started using it, you know, in, uh, you know, what the hell is happening to democracy at whitehouse.gov, things like that. Oop. And then finally, we had HTML, which was built on top of the HTTP protocol that we talked about. Vague but exciting, as Tim Berners-Lee's supervisor said. Completely missing the boat on that one. Oh, my controller has just gone mad. Sorry. Um, and I mention all of this. I talk about all these things because the web is incredibly strong. And we never, ever stop to appreciate this. And it's strong because of the simplicity of all those little technologies put together, layered on top of one another, each one making use of the layer before it. Especially HTML itself, which is now, it's a simple declarative language, something that we use all the time, but it's a simple declarative language. And we never stop to think what declarative means in this context, do we? Because, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, HTML is a declarative language, but what does that mean? Well, to me, it means that HTML is flirty. You know, it's a little bit flirty. It likes to call up the browser late at night and say things like, hey, baby, how's it going? Um, I was, like, totally thinking we could get some paragraphs and a header on page. You know, could you, could you do that for me, you know? And the browser's like, oh, my God, yeah, this is amazing. Yeah, I'll totally do that for you. And it agrees to do it. And this flirtation, this, this requesting of things, makes the web incredibly strong. Because you see here, I'm running the Amazon uh, DA website, and I'm pulling out chunks of the code from the page as it is running. Can we take a second and think how incredible that is? We can pull out chunks of a running web page, and yet right at the end, I can still click on the shopping cart icon and carry on as if nothing had happened. That's incredible. And that strength and that robustness is why the web is so popular nowadays, why it is everywhere in our lives. It's in every pocket. It's on every refrigerator, it feels like. It dominates because it is robust, because it was born into this weird heterozygous world of muddy waters and great areas where things could not be relied upon. It's robust. And the things it does could not be done by a strict language. Absolutely no way. A strict language would fall over and die in this position. And it's not the only reason why the web is popular, of course. Again, we just heard from Jeremy, we've heard from other people about Tim Berners-Lee giving up all the intellectual property rights on the web and making it available to everyone. Anyone can build a browser. Anyone can download a browser. There's no restrictions for any operating system. You can do this. And this meant that the early web, right from the start, was an absolutely bizarre place, <laughs> filled with weird shit all over there. It was a place where you could declare your love for your favorite pop star. Where, you know, we, struggling authors could get their start in the world. And tiny little startups could have a crack at this whole web thing and it's see if it took them anywhere. The early web was incredible. I'm so privileged I got to see it the first time around. But, I'm going to use the word but a lot in this talk. The bad times are sure to follow, aren't they? Any of the good times, there's always going to be some bad times. And what was once free and weird slowly became commercialized and balkanized 
and locked in. Again, I don't know if anybody can remember these two browsers. But at one point, the web got split between them effectively. Developers had to write their code so that it worked on either of their browsers. You had different forks for different browsers. Your JavaScript, or, well, not JavaScript, DHTML as we called it in those days, had to work in one of them. And people had to declare their loyalty by putting little banners at the bottom of their page. This page is best viewed in Internet Explorer or Netscape Navigator 4.7. Make sure you're using at least 800 by 600 pixels. And this led to a complete lack of innovation for a while. Again, anyone who was around in that period can remember the time when we felt like we were stuck with Internet Explorer 6 for decades, it felt like when nothing changed, nothing interesting happened. But this period of innovation freezing changed because of this device, I would argue, this unexpected direction, because the iPhone appeared, didn't it? And it completely upset all of our expectations about how things should be. Now, I'm no iPhone lover, you know, I'm no Mac lover. I know I'm using one on stage here, but I stole that, you know, no worries there. But the iPhone was a gift because it was the first great lesson that we had in diversity. Because suddenly, these sites that we built that were, could only work in Internet Explorer or Netscape 4.7, suddenly had to work on a completely new form factor, with a completely new interface, with all different metaphors for how things worked. And it blew our tiny collective minds. And we had to learn about responsive web design. Ethan Marcotte came along and told us good lessons there about how to do things. And the reason we did this is because we didn't want to exclude people. We didn't want people to turn up to our websites and not be able to use them. Main, sometimes that was because of morality. A lot of the times that was because it was sheer business sense. It's a time that gave us this, the pyramid of robustness, as I like to think of it. When sites had distinct separation of concerns, when we had layers of technology, with the most robust things, the most hardy things, those things that are declarative and could fail really, you know, in only the most extreme circumstances, sitting at the bottom with the next most least, six, blah, I've gone ahead to speak English, with the next least robust things sitting on top, in the next layers going up. So the things that are most fragile sitting at the top there. And it served the web incredibly well for years. This technique worked. Like Jeremy said, you know, it was the silver bullet that fixed things. And it was a good time. It was a really good time for the web. A time of diversity and empathy. When we loved and embraced and accepted that people were different to us. It was the web's summer of love. That word, but, again. Are we starting to repeat this little cycle? We've gone through it at least once now, and are we just trying to enter into it again? Because we've got to the point, haven't we? Well, we haven't got to the point. We got to the point at least two years ago where the average web page size is about two megabytes. This isn't for video or for GIFs or anything like that. This is for basic content sites. The average is two megabytes. You might say, whatever, two megabytes, Charlie. But if I told you this fact, that 53% of users abandon sites that take more than three seconds to load, and then told you that the average site loading time on 3G is 12 seconds, it's a bit of a, what? Oh, okay, I never considered it that way. And again, you might just say, 
Charlie, whatever, get with it, Grandma. That's just on mobile phones, you know? Well, guess what most of the developing world is on? Most of the upcoming billion people who are going to be using the internet. They're on things like this. This is the Moto G4. This is literally the most average phone on the planet. It's a low processing device, does not run JavaScript easily, and it has got a high latency connection. It does not download things easily. And yet, this is the thing that most people are using. And again, you might go be folding your arms at this point and be talking about, whoa, whatever, Charlie, that's like, that's like just the Indian and Chinese customers. We don't need them. Goodness, I'm not talking about them, I'm talking about my customers. And say, okay, like, whatever, you know, Mr. Hypothetical Racist Person, you know. But what about if you applied this to the USA, for example? A place where outside of metropolitan areas, you are not going to find 3G connections ever. And in fact, I saw one statistic recently that said the, the average wired connection, you know, to the home for a USA household, rural areas, is 56 kbps dial-up connection. No broadband out there in the countryside, and yet we're building sites as if they needed to be downloaded via fibre connections. We've also got to the point where accessibility is kind of an unknown, isn't it, still? I know we all talk about it, we see all the blog posts going out there, but we don't really do it, do we? And you can tell that we don't really do it because we don't put it into our job adverts. How many job adverts do you see where accessibility is the number one criteria for a developer? Zero. And we've got to the point, haven't we, where we've started to kind of think that maybe we should be delivering things by JavaScript as a default where we should be sending HTML or data over the wire and letting JavaScript handle things in the client for us. And I was going to say here permission to rant about this issue, but this is my fucking talk and I can rant as much as I want to. <laughs> to me, this feels like... It's like building a flying car in your garage, isn't it? It's like ordering the kit from overseas and putting it together in your garage and testing it out and then taking it out onto the road and then taking it down the road and taking off and soaring to work and landing in your car park space two kilometers away. Wow, that's amazing. I applaud you. That is absolutely wonderful. But wouldn't it have been better to buy a fucking bicycle instead? It's a prime example of how we fall in love with the technical over-engineering so easily, don't we? We're building the sites that we want to, want to build instead of the things that the user wants to build. And before you get me wrong, I am not talking smack on JavaScript. Believe me, I use it every day. I'm not talking smack on it. I'm not saying that, you know, games like this have to be progressively enhanced, or a drawing application in the browser, or the amazing stuff that Ruth showed us earlier have to be done progressively enhanced. They don't. There's no need to do that. I'm talking about content sites the medium for which the web was invented. 99% still of what the web is about. I don't know if that's a real number. I'm plucking it out of my arse. But I feel that it's a real number. Because we've got kind of this FOMO, haven't we? We feel that everybody is building a single-page application in the latest framework, and oh my god, that blog post said I should be using this new technology, and I haven't used TypeScript to check all my code. Oh god, I'm a failure. I'm a real failure as a developer, aren't I? But this isn't the reality. The top 15 sites on the planet are basic content sites. Things that you do not need 
huge amounts of client-side technology to achieve. Yes, even things like yeah, um, YouTube, even stuff like Twitter and Facebook. These are all easily progressively enhanced. We've got to the point where content sites are suddenly starting to become brittle. Things that used to be robust and amazing are suddenly starting to fail when there's bad network connections or when the user blocks JavaScript for some reason, which they do, or when an advert spews out bad JavaScript that contaminates your entire page and everything goes down. These things happen. And suddenly we've made pages and sites that are fragile. And it's like we've turned that pyramid of robustness upside down. With the most fragile things, the imperative code that shatters if one byte is wrong, suddenly sitting at the bottom, taking all the weight. I'm no physical engineer, but I know that the Egyptians did not actually build pyramids like this. They are inherently unstable when built like this. It's proven, science has proved it. Ask me, I work for a scientific publisher. <laughs> and maybe we've got to the point where we're kind of thinking about resume-driven development a little bit. You know, we kind of base our technology choices upon what's going to look good on our CV, don't we? The word users and user research, that kind of disappeared from our collective vocabulary. And we don't like to think about that. We're back to the point where we're starting to exclude people again. Deliberately, we're starting to say, you groups of users, you can't use my website. You? Okay, you can use my website. All because we want to have our fun. But this is a bit negative, isn't it? I know this is a bit negative. This is kind of what I'm known for now, being the negative Nelly on things. So I'm going to suggest some positive things that we can do. Because there are things we can do now to stop this cycle from kicking in again. And to me, the biggest thing that we can do is to start cultivating a culture of empathy. I have to be really sure I'm saying the word empathy there and not emphasis, which I'm really prone to doing, so I apologize if I get this wrong for the rest of the talk. Empathy is hard. It's really hard to do for people. Despite it being wired into us, somehow society tries to push it out of us. On the other hand, technology, I would argue, is quite easy. You can just go and use your favorite search engine and find out how to do things and build up your knowledge that way. You cannot do the same for empathy. It's something that you have to enact. So I'm going to share just a few tips here, just five tips that I find help me to do that culture of empathy and to help me build better websites that work for everybody. And the first one of those is trying to get back to a bit more of a, a simple technology mindset. Just a little bit. And it's a little bit meta than my other tips here. You know, those, these others might be a bit more technical. But this one is a bit hippy-dippy, you know? Because I think we need to do this. I, need to, I think we need to step back a little bit on our rush forward with technology. Okay, I'm seeing some faces there that aren't convinced. So oh, I've just revealed the actual thing here. Hands up here if you do work for Facebook. No, no one here works for Facebook. Yet, we spend all of our time trying to be like Facebook, don't we? In our technology stacks, uh, st stacks and the way that we work, we try to be like them. And yet, they're an tech-driven, engineering-centric, corporate beast who almost 
allowed the destruction of democracy. <laughs> and for some reason, we use them as the role model for how we should do things. When we try to be like them, I think it introduces chaos and complexity into a world that is already complex enough. So I say step back from this kind of thing. But how can we make our products more simple? How can we manifest this? Well, there's many ways. And like I said, the best way is to use the least tech possible. I really just sound like some kind of, you know, Amish, kind of like least tech possible person. I don't care. I'm going to put that as a selling label on my work from now on. HTML first, or service side generation, as we like to call it in the old days, is probably the best example of this. HTML generated on the server is 100% inclusive. You don't need any more technology than a basic web browser to do that. It doesn't matter the browser you're using, the age of the browser, the conditions you're in, HTML will work. It's fast. It is incredibly fast. I know we like to talk about uh, sending uh, JavaScript apps over the, over the pipe and hydrating them with data and things like that. But seriously, just sending HTML in the first place, that is faster most of the time. Go look at any of the talks by Ian Feather. Go look at work by people like uh, Netflix, who are just doing server-side generation for things now. They know this stuff is faster. It takes zero processing power on the client. You know, we talked about that Moto G4 up there. This doesn't require any processing power there for it to render things. And it's fundamentally inclusive and fundamentally accessible. Assuming you follow step two, which is about building with semantics. Because this is a really easy one for us to do, yet as we saw again today, people do not do it. People love their div soup, don't they? They love a taste of the tasty div soup. But why do things better? Again, we saw today, you do that because you get so many things for free. You make something that works for everybody, and yet you get so much with it. You get accessibility baked in from the ground up. That's wonderful. What a free gift we have, and yet we ignore it all the time. is absolutely incredible. You can do this yourself, of course. Like we saw earlier, we could have divs, and we could put ARIA labels on there, and we can replicate things with JavaScript. But again, that is fragile. You're introducing fragility into a system and complexity into a system that you don't need to. And besides which, somebody else has done the work for you. Aren't devs meant to be lazy? That's our kind of thing. That's our constant motif. We're lazy. We like to write less code. Why don't we just accept what the browser gives us most of the time? And the third step in this, I said five steps. We've just got we're third, the third step here. So we're halfway through. Don't worry. I know I'm standing between you and the pub. Don't worry, we're going to get there. <laughs> I really want to drink also. Um, now, this might be unfamiliar to many, this kind of this notion of designing and developing progressively. But if you're familiar with things like Lean UX, if you've heard of phrases like minimum viable product and agile and things like that, you're probably on the right road for this. And this is something that we do at my company, at Springer Nature. I talked about them. This is actually something we enact all the time, and it's absolutely fantastic. Because it's that layered story again. I keep talking about these layers of technologies building up. Well, we can also apply that to the process of things. So we combine those previous two techniques, simplicity and accessibility. And we start with the absolute minimum. We start with server-side generated HTML. 
And then we start layering things on top of that gradually. We layer on some, you know, it starts out like this as HTML, then we layer on some really simple CSS, then we layer on some more advanced CSS. And, you know, that's stuff that you can pull from a design system, you can pull in all these little chunks. We're not talking about designing from scratch, we're just talking about proving concepts with the browsers, with the users, because we test this with users, this right now. Not the visual designs, not the pretty things, we test this to see if users can use our navigation, if we show them all the data that is necessary for them to use the site. And then we add on these extra things and we add on stuff like JavaScript and our animations. At each stage that we do this, we have a fully working product that is usable by users, even if it's not pretty. The layers of the pyramid reflected in that design process. And why do we do this? Well, to me, that Bauhaus quote, you know, form follows function, sums it up for us. Because the form should follow the function. The form is the interface, the function Yes, that's the right way around. The function is the HTML that's there. It's the information architecture of a site revealed. And it forces teams, designers and developers to think about content and information architecture first, before the visuals and before the code. It's a really radically different way of doing things. And talking of radicalism, you can use, we use similar techniques to make our sites available to everybody. And if I told you that is, that is possible, that you can make your site work with somebody, even if they step out of an Internet Explorer 5.5 powered time machine, oh God, imagine that monstrosity. It is absolutely possible to do this. And how to do this? Well, Chris at the back, who's not paying attention right now, <laughs> gave us this quote, which was that it's not okay to block old browsers, but it's a waste of time to support them all 100%. No, I didn't. Change your name, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> That's as far as it um, We don't support them all in the same way. That's our secret. That's what we do at our company. And we use something called cutting the mustard to make that support happen in different ways. And you might have heard about cutting the mustard. That's something that the BBC pioneered years ago, and they've established it and made it work. And we've taken that and used it in a slightly different way. Because like I said earlier, we take those, we have those really simple server-side generated sites first, the server-side generated version, HTML first. We take that and we add on a really basic style sheet to it, incredibly basic, just this. Enough to constrain it in the browser slightly and do some text styling, some minor font changes, but most of the time using native form controls and basic browser font sizing, whatever the browser gives us. And because that's built with semantic HTML and server-side generated first, it works for 100% of users, guaranteed. That works for everybody. But we don't stop there, because I think our marketing people would actually come down like a mighty meteor and destroy us if we tried to launch a site like that. We would be out of a job in seconds. So that's why we use this, which is a media query that allows us to load in the more advanced CSS. You saw it in that example there, where we took uh, more in interesting visuals to put on top. And this media query is really amazing because this allows us to select for all the latest browsers, all the modern versions of browsers out there. 
So things like, I, I make it look like this, by the way. You know, this, this is what I'm talking about. And it was select for things like Firefox, Safari, Chrome, all the latest versions of it. Unfortunately, that also includes Internet Explorer 11 uh, because of the, of the media query that we use. But there is a version out there that allows you to do this without including Internet Explorer 11. Um, the reason we include Internet Explorer 11 is because scientists have not figured out how to upgrade their computers yet. <laughs> and still approximately 6% of our web traffic is Internet Explorer 11. So the business do not like it if we exclude them. And then I talked about layering on JavaScript on top. And you can, just the same way, you can load JavaScript using that media query. And that might be a bit of a, what? You're using CSS to load JavaScript? Well, not quite. We're using something called the Windows match media method. And that's something that allows you to feed in a media query and to see if it passes, true or false. So we feed in that media query from the page earlier that we used to load. And if that media query passes, you know, if it's a modern browser in some way, the last few versions it selects for, then that means the JavaScript can be used as well. We're confident that the JavaScript can be used. And so we load that in. And this is an incredibly simple and beautiful technique, I think. One that allows stuff to work for everybody. And that's the practical reason for it, really. Because it's partly selfish, yes. We do want to just make our lives easier. We don't want to be supporting different visuals for Internet Explorer 8, you know? Internet Explorer 7, things like that, just because the CEO uses a terrible browser at home. We don't try to do that. It allows us to use things like Grid and all those amazing sexy technologies that are coming along and to use them with confidence in the browser. But the main reason for doing it is because it's for the users. This enables it to work for 100% of users out there, again. And it doesn't cost us anything. It doesn't take a different technique to do. It's just a different mindset, that's all. One that considers users first and does not consider our sites only available for the rich or for the lucky. And you can go check that out. You can go check that out on, if you go, go um, not to Google, if you go use your favorite search engine <laughs> and look for Springer Nature Front End Playbook, you can find out how we did that. And then the final step, because I've been a bit cheeky here and I've overrun deliberately, but I'm the last one. And again, nobody's going to be late because of me. The final step, test, test, test. Test like the professional you are. Because we do love tests, don't we? You know, we love writing tests. We love writing unit tests. And we love writing end-to-end -end tests and functional tests. But we don't seem to like testing for actual end users, do we? We don't test for them. We test our code, but we don't test for users. And I've seen everybody here today using, you know, uh, things like... Oh, um, MacBooks. I can see some of them glowing away now. That's got stuff like voiceover built in. There is no excuse for not testing your site with a screen reader immediately. Same with Windows. It's got Narrator built in. Just go and use it now. If you go on Mac, press Command and F5 and get going. Similarly, people need to be testing things with their keyboards. I'm pretty sure everybody here develops with a keyboard don't you? You have them, test with them, try them out. Just use the tab key and see how your site works for people who might be using, uh, or might have limited mobility issues or using a switch device. It's an easy thing to do, easy empathy example. And I was going to say here to throttle your connection and try things out in the dev tools see how it works for lower speed users. But fuck that, seriously. Just use it with real hardware instead. 
Start checking your sites on phones that have got crack screens, that are really low-end devices. Try using it in direct sunlight and see how your site works. Because we tend to assume that if it works on our 3,000 euro Mac or the 1,000 euro iPhone that we have in our pocket, that it works for everybody. And that simply isn't true. You have to do this stuff because testing for accessibility in this way is a core part of your jobs, a core part of our jobs. That's what we're there for. We're there to make code that works for users. That's our job. If you want to just play with code, frankly, go and work on the back end. Do something there. Our job is about users. OK, in summary, so I said that the World Wide Web is strong. It's strong because of that robustness and that simplicity of things. Each one of those simple technologies building on top of the other. And as a result of that robustness and that simplicity, it's become essential for everybody. It's become vital to the world. So let's start defending that robustness, enabling that robustness, and therefore enabling it for users. Let's not make it about us. Let's make it for them and the world wide web. Thank you. <laughs>